Hello, and welcome to The Excerpt. I'm Dana Taylor. What can we learn by listening, yes, listening, to icebergs? Icebergs are bellwethers of environmental changes. Their formation, movement, and melting offer insights into some of the most extreme areas of the cryosphere, such as Antarctica, Greenland, and the Arctic Ocean. Scientists have long monitored icebergs because of their role in regulating our climate. But what do the sounds they create reveal? Geophysicist Vera Schlinwein, professor of polar and marine seismology at the University of Bremen in Germany, now joins us to discuss these breathtaking frozen wonders. Thanks for joining me, Vera. Hello, and you're welcome. First, how do the sounds produced by icebergs calving, cracking, and melting help with understanding the health of glaciers? And how far away can that monitoring be done? In principle, we have to distinguish a whole cacophony of different sounds and cracking and so on. And um, then it depends a lot on what we can actually learn. Carving is different sounds from melting, is different sounds from icebergs um, hitting the ground, for example. So um, this depends a little bit. And it's also because the signals are very tricky. It's also difficult to actually trace them back to their source in many cases. And how far away is that monitoring done? Monitoring um, carving, for example, is done in immediate vicinity of the carving sites, which is uh, logistically very tricky because, of course, you don't want your instruments to be uh, damaged. But, for example, the enormous um, tabular icebergs of Antarctica, when they run into ground, this can be heard or felt across the entire Southern Ocean thousands of kilometers away. So we have uh, to do with totally different um, distances depending on what we are uh, after. And then for non-scientists like me, what is iceberg calving? Iceberg calving is when there's a little bit uh, of ice stream that runs into the ocean and um, it's moving. And when it encounters the ocean, It forms an ice tongue, and this ice tongue is um, unstable, and there's bits and pieces breaking off every now and then as this ice moves into the ocean. And this is what we call carving. We heard some of the compelling audio you captured. Can you describe what we were listening to and where it was captured? It was captured in uh, Antarctica at the German Neumeyer station, And it captures the sound of enormously big tabular icebergs. We are talking about um, dimensions of tens of kilometers. When they hit the ground and get stuck while they travel in a current, in a um, circumpolar current in Antarctica, and uh, when they get stuck and move around the ground, then they produce these uh, songs. What type of technologies are being used and developed to to study these sounds? And do the sounds vary by region? The technology we use are basically seismometers that are installed for recording earthquakes. So it's no specific um, technology that we needed to um, listen to or to detect these sounds. Another way of hearing these iceberg songs are so-called hydrophones in the water column. They are installed, for example, in the Southern Ocean or in the Indian Ocean to monitor any kind of sounds. And apart from that, there is nothing specific um, than one needs or needs to uh, develop. By using sound, are you able to discern the scale of transformation of icebergs, glaciers, ice shelves. Where do you hope this research takes us? This was mostly a uh, curiosity-driven research. The sounds are so obvious when you look at the uh, seismic signals in search of earthquakes, then you see these totally even vibrations. So we first thought that was an instrument malfunctioning until we realized that this sound came from different directions when icebergs travel past. So 
that was more than an ex like an accidental um, uh, discovery. It's very difficult to um, actually scale it with the size of the iceberg because the way the signal is generated, we call this signal a harmonic tremor signal and harmonic tremor signals typically hide their source. They are just produced by a tiny little quakes that repeat each other at a certain frequency, at a very steady frequency. And this kind of phenomenon can be produced um, in many settings. For example, if you think of strong wind and uh, of, uh, wires that start singing, that's sort of the same kind of phenomenon. You just reproduce a signal very often and then it turns into a song and the speed of the repetition then um, makes the melody go up and down. And from that, it's not easy to conclude back, for example, on the size of the iceberg. So there is no way from the sound or from the, um, the sort of the song to conclude back on the iceberg. The only thing we know is that it must get in touch with either the ground or other icebergs. In terms of both intensity and specific frequencies, What's the underwater impact of the sounds made by icebergs on marine life? And has there been a noticeable change as the Earth's climate warms? Some of these iceberg sounds are within the range of um, hearing of certain marine mammals. But I would say they are probably used to this kind of background noise. And at the moment, um, we have not specifically seen a change in the um, amount of noise. It's very, um, these strong noises are specific to the Southern Ocean and the cryosphere in the Southern Ocean is very complex. So there may be more carving in future, but if the icebergs are thinner, for example, and don't hit the ground anymore, then we would get less of a signal. If there's more icebergs around, they collide more, maybe we get more of a signal. So um, if the sea ice decreases, icebergs are more mobile and don't get stuck and hit each other, for example. So there's an enormous complexity of different um, um, processes that may take place so that I would, it is not the first choice in monitoring our cryosphere. <laughs> From affecting temperature salinity and the circulation of ocean currents, can you Help us better understand the role icebergs play in our climate system. Icebergs um, carry a lot of fresh water, meteoritic water that is frozen in these um, icebergs. And when they travel to the ocean and melt, they will release um, fresh non-saline water and then locally change, of course, the um, characteristics of the water column. And I think there's still a, little, a lot of research needed to incorporate that into our models and all the small-scale effects of icebergs as well. You're a global expert in polar and marine seismology. Are the movements of icebergs changing the ocean floor? What are the potential ramifications there? When icebergs are very um, high, they can um, plow through the ocean uh, ground, of course, and um, so ice she uh, shelf areas, so the shallow water areas around the continents, they typically um, show the traces of icebergs. And we know this from past climate, and these iceberg traces are visible in um, sediment records everywhere and help us also understand glaciation history um, back in time when we can see, for example, how sediment on the seafloor were disturbed by iceberg calving or iceberg travelings, I should say. What's the most fascinating thing that you've learned or experienced while studying icebergs? Well, I'm really intrigued by how we can learn from the melody of the songs what is going on. For example, the songs start with um, high uh, tones and then they get lower and lower as the icebergs slow down. Often this happens with the tides, for example. Icebergs um, are stuck in a 
a parking lot, an iceberg parking lot and swing with the tides back and forth. And the song stops when they are, um, when the tide changes the direction and then the iceberg picks up speed again. And we learn about this kind of harmonic tremor signals. I found this very fascinating because these um, harmonic tremors um, are present in many locations on Earth. Likewise on volcanoes. My background is volcano seismology and I knew these tremor signals from uh, volcanoes um, where there can be similar uh, processes, rhythmic processes that cause um, volcanoes singing. And um, I find it fascinating when we can produce the same kind of songs and we really need to listen to the melody to understand um, what is actually behind as a physical process. So you mentioned volcanoes, and I'll end with this. With the songs that you've studied there, do they differ in any way from the songs that you are now experiencing and discovering with icebergs? I worked uh, for my master's thesis on an Indonesian volcano, and if you played those songs to me uh, and the iceberg songs, um, I potentially would not be able to to tell them apart until now I have understood some of the pattern of these iceberg songs that we typically hear the melodies as the icebergs often start with a higher speed and then slow down. And so the melody goes and starts again. And for volcanoes, it might be it might be different depending on what kind of sounds there are. There's sometimes uh, different melodies. And I think having studied this a little bit better, I could recognize this. We also have with our instruments ourselves um, the kind of songs, for example, um, we need um, on ocean bottom seismometers, we need recovery ropes. So when the ocean bottom seismometer surfaces and we need to catch them from a ship, we need a rope. And this rope also starts swinging in the current, um, in ocean bottom currents, and plays also a melody. And so at first I thought, wow, so many volcanoes, until I realized that this is a uh, the song of the instrument itself. So it's it's in very many circumstances that one produces these kind of singing songs and, and every song has very much uh, characteristic features and they then tell something about the source of the song. Well, thank you so much for the sounds that you were able to share with us, Vera, and for being on the excerpt. Thank you. Thanks for watching. I'm Dana Taylor. I'll see you next time.